module five, and uh, that is here. All right. So we're talking about online investigations. Um, and one of the main things you do online, I mean, if you listen to um, Paul's Security Podcast, there's a guy named Tyler who is big, deep into threat research, and he has dozens of fake personas, pretending to be Russian and everything, pretending to be criminals. He infiltrated all these crime gangs, and he's always talking about it. And you have to do it. This is what, part of the game. Just like a cop works undercover, you make online fake personas to get him where you need to go. And so um, you can build a profile, do a recon online, you can do surveillance. So if you want, you can begin monitoring people. You, uh, the physical people watch your trash and your residence and your movements and daily routines online. You can do all these things. Watch their social media posts and things like that to track what they're doing, wiretaps, things like that. And then ultimately you generally do a sting operation. The best thing is to catch the criminal in the act of doing the bad thing. This is why there was a gadget for sale a few years ago that police would buy that looks like a cell phone, you'd carry it, and it measures the amount of wireless data that's being transmitted, like the dial. So when you're gonna catch somebody for doing something illegal online, you wait for them to come home, you watch the light come on, and you wait until they start downloading the stuff, like the porn, the, aren't the illegal porn. Then you have a UPS guy drive up like a UPS driver and pound on the door, he comes down, and then you wrestle him to the ground, you catch him in the act of doing the bad thing. Then you've really got him. Then they can't claim somebody else did it or it was a virus or something. You, that's what you wanna do. You wanna catch him in the act of doing the bad thing, that's the best way. So to generate an identity, you make a sock puppet. A sock puppet is a fake online identity uh, that you pretend to be somebody else. Uh, there's fake name generators. There's another tool called This Person Does Not Exist. There's a bunch of online artificial intelligence generated photographs. So you don't need to take a photograph of a real person where you might get caught. Um, you can make email accounts all over the place and you can make temporary email accounts that don't go anywhere like Mailinator and Mail Expire are temporary email accounts that won't lead anywhere. Um, you don't want one tied to your IP address or your ISP or anything like that. Um, there's ways to send texts online or you can just use a burner phone to send texts. I know a Kara Swisher, a famous journalist, she actually has a burner phone just for TikTok because she's so suspicious of TikTok spying on her. Use a special phone just for that so there won't be any other data on that phone. Um, then there's a bunch of ways to move money around online of course, with all the cryptocurrencies, and there's VPNs like crazy, and there's Tor. Now, a VPN encrypts your data and your traffic so that nobody can read it except the intended recipient, but Tor hides your physical location. Now, if you have a VPN, if you VPN to a VPN server, everybody that tries to figure out where you are will find the location of the server. If it's a commercial server, it might have an account list and they might respond to subpoenas and stuff, so they might expose your identity. Um, but Tor hides your identity to where nobody can find you except the US military. This is something that every few years the users of Tor rediscover this fact. Tor was a US Navy project. It is now almost entirely run by the Department of Defense. So they can probably track you through Tor, but nobody else can. Anyway, um, but the original plan of Tor was that it would be volunteers everywhere contributing servers to the network so nobody could track you. But what happened is so much horrible stuff started going over Tor, viruses, child pornography, online attacks, that almost everybody who was donating Tor servers quit doing it. I ran one for a while and I took it down. MIT ran it, and even MIT took it down, and they're really the bastions of free speech and unfiltered internet. To represent the only people that will still run Tor nodes are the military so they can spy on it. So anyway, you're kind of handing your data to the US military, but it does mean people cannot physically locate you. And Tails OS is a special high privacy Linux version of an operating system that uses Tor and many other tools to greatly make you more private. So you people will not be able to spy on you if you're using Tails. So yeah. OS, I think when everything was stored on the RAM, when you restart the machine, it just deletes everything? Uh, there's a bunch of them that do that. I mean, uh, there's one I mentioned before, which was Cubes, Q-U-B-E-S, uh, which is another, let me bring it up. Cubes is a high privacy one from Joanna Rutzkausa. And this one here, what happens is it's a Linux operating system and it runs about five virtual machines and each one is color coded and the idea is you'll use one color for your social networking and one color for your banking and they can't reach each other. That if, however, 
Um, I've heard it's really hard to use and really buggy. Uh, people complain a lot. So it's only for the pretty tough Linux users like the kind of people that would use Arch. But it's another. Yeah, Tails OS. It's the one, yeah. Yeah, this. I saw video on Tails OS. Uh, yeah, Tails. Tails yeah. has been around longer. I think Tails is somewhat friendlier. It's around. So whenever you boot that, everything is stored in the RAM. So no one can read something from the hard disk. OK, so it doesn't store anything. No. That's when you restart the machine, when you shut down, you just do it everything. So it forgets everything? Yes. So you, you have to re-log in and you can't store any data? Well, well that's something. That's why it's like so secure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tails, Tails is a good one. All right, good. So, um, all right, anyway. Uh, then there's, you can mask your identity when making phone calls. This is a well-known trick. You can forge the uh, from address in your phone calls, the caller ID. Um, and you can, of course, use lots of proxies. There's a lot of proxies out there just to forward your traffic from another server, so it's hard to track it back to you. So these are services to know about and services that all the criminals use. Um, so law enforcement can use a program to track criminals by switching phone carriers or use reverse lookups. They have some ability to punch through anonymity uh, actions in the telephone network. Um, and that's because of Kalia. There's a law which requires the phone network to provide assistance to law enforcement, like making it possible to tap a call and they, they can do a wiretap on phone calls. There is no way to wiretap Skype or online chat or instant messages or anything because internet companies do not provide that because they don't have to. Uh, the FBI has been trying for at least 20 years to pass a CALEA for the internet so that all the internet service providers and companies would have to provide wiretaps for internet traffic and that law has never passed. So there is no way to intercept telephone calls done with Skype or other online services right now. A mobile phone? Uh, that goes through the normal phone network and it can be wiretapped. It can also be stingrayed, which is mostly what they do. They will drive a truck near your house and put up a fake cell phone tower, which has a higher power than the real one, and all the phones will connect to it. Then they downgrade it to use like GPS 2, so it uses, or whatever it is, version 2, so it uses an old, weak encryption they can crack, and then they can intercept your phone calls. But, but you, don't, you don't have like text messaging, messaging the face on the internet, right? uh, Text messages are unencrypted, and they're incredibly easy to intercept. People do it all the time. I don't know exactly how, though. But I mean, text messages are like postcards. They're not encrypted anyway, so they can be intercepted a lot of places. SMS. Um, if you use Signal or Telegram, then it's encrypted and harder to break into. And the only effective way to do it is to put malware on one of the endpoints and then steal it before it gets encrypted. It's end -to -end encrypted right? What's that? It's end -to -end encrypted. Yes, end-to-end -end encrypted. So the way you steal that is you have to infect the endpoint and steal it before it gets encrypted. Yeah. But what about calls? Do you have any platform that offers end-to-end -end encrypted calls, something like that? Or? Um, Skype, I think, is not end-to-end -end encrypted calls. Um, I don't think end-to-end. -end because if that's like what's called a law, like Well, supposedly WhatsApp. But that's text, right? I don't yeah. think it does sound. Text, I know, but I heard um, it well, you know, it's a good question. I, uh, I do not know of anything that gives you an end-to-end -end encrypted voice call. In principle, it could exist, but I don't think they have a voice calling feature in Telegram or Signal. That would be the place to put it. Uh, Somebody probably knows, but I don't know of it. It's a good question. Let's see if anybody online has the answer. Is there an end-to-end -end encrypted voice call? Um, aren't texts iOS to non-iOS unencrypted? Yes, I think all texts everywhere are unencrypted. And the Patriot Act, I'm not sure it covers the phone communication. That was already pretty much wide open anyway because of Kalia. But the Patriot Act does give the government um, the rights to sort of blast through all privacy protections if they claim that they're investigating a case of terrorism. Um, although it's gotten a lot worse than that. The NSA, in fact, spies on a lot of American citizens illegally, leaks it out illegally, and they're pretty much getting away with it right now. Um, so your privacy in America is quite questionable. And if you're not an American citizen, you have no privacy at all. The government can just snoop on everything and you have no legal protection at all. And even if you are an American citizen, they seem to like go around and do it anyway and get away with it. Um, and then of course there's the dark web. Now if you go on Google and search, you're only seeing 
the surface web, which are pages that are just wide open and everybody can see them. And 95% of the web is not available there. Now, it doesn't mean it's all criminal. Most of it is behind a login, like your Gmail. Your Gmail is not a secret, not classified, but it's just not, you have to log in to get to it. So it's part of the dark web. But most people worry about is the, the Tor-based dark web. And that is stuff that is hiding because it's really illegal or dangerous or something. Um, so there's a framework here to help you organize your, your online searching with all these different categories, dating and blogs and language translation. And if you look at the dark web, they've expanded it here. And so you can get general information about the dark web. There are clients to get on the dark web. You need a Tor client. You need the Tor Vidalia browser. And you, a client lets you go into the Tor network. See, if you use Tor as a client, then it hides your traffic so nobody can tell who you are when you're browsing the web. But you can also put a server on Tor, and now nobody can physically locate that server. In fact, nobody can even reach it unless they connect to Tor. So you have to run a special client, and now you can surf the dark web, which are people who have hidden their physical location, almost always because what they're doing is illegal. You could do it just because as some kind of stunt or because you're a privacy fanatic, but 99% of the people that do it, they do it because what they're doing is illegal. And so um, you can surf on the dark web and you can find stolen data, hacked data, um, malware, child porn, people selling drugs and guns and murder for hire and just anything, the, anything in the criminal marketplace is there. And a lot of information is there. And a lot of researchers do this. Um, for example, they constantly scan the dark web to find out who's been hacked and to warn people if your company's been hacked um, as people dump the data. So there are scanners to try to find things on the Tor network. And there are directories of things that choose to be public. Uh, and the, various things like that. In general, you have Tor address is usually like about 40 random characters, dot onion, so nobody will ever find it by trying to search them all, but there are various directories. And of course, most people do publish the address of their Tor server. Nobody would ever find it otherwise, but they usually publish it on like a forum somewhere or a telegraph group to the interested people, and it's usually not intended to just be public, but there is a listings of the ones that do become public. And of course, some of them are looking for general traffic like the Silk Road. I don't know, the Silk Road and Silk Road 2 both went down. I don't think there's a third one, but they're equivalent ones, marketplaces, which are supposed to be like eBay for illegal stuff. And there's a ton of money to be made there, uh, selling drugs and guns and stuff. And um, all right, anyway, so. I like dark web that you can get free books. Free books? Oh, sure. Pirate stuff. Pirate everything. Yes, absolutely. Um, everything is there. Yeah. Of course, you don't know if it's got viruses in it or anything, so you want to be careful, but, you know, that's the same as the torrents. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff available. Uh, I remember one time I was doing a malware research project, and I needed a file, and I couldn't find it, and I searched and searched, and finally I found myself downloading a gigabyte of malware from an Iranian torrent site, and that's when I said, I'm going to just walk away from the computer and rethink my life choices. I've ended up in a dark place here. <laughs> There's probably some other way to do this project that is not this insane. <laughs> but, you know, you, you, I try this, I try this. Oh, this might work, this might work. And pretty soon you're in some dark place you really shouldn't be in. Anyway, uh, let's see. Normal SMS messaging, yeah. Have I been pwned? Does something like that? Well, let's see. Um, I have not used BARD to get information from my Gmail accounts. I just read about that today. BARD will supposedly now search your Gmail. So if you choose to, so I haven't tried it, but that would be interesting. Um, and uh, all right, uh, normal SMS messages, yeah. All right, so anyway. Um, all right, so that's Tor. We've talked about it. Um, and uh, it has down to ground sites like the Silk Road and many others where you, various things are going on, almost all of them somewhat illegal. And they end in dot onion, although I have seen some domains that claim to be Tor hidden sites that didn't end in dot onion, and I didn't completely understand that. I thought they all ended as dot onion. I think there might be a few other domains now behind Tor. So Tails is the Linux operating system that provides anonymity through using Tor and other products. And there's another thing like Tor called the Invisible Internet Project. I've never used it, but it's another Tor-like anonymity system. And then there's Freenet. Now, this is IRC. IRC is the original instant message prog 
protocol. It started in, I think, like the 70s or 80s, and originally, you'd have people using a Unix server, and you would chat with other people using the same Unix server, because they go to the same college or belong to the same company. That's all it was. And then people connected the Unix servers together, so you'd get from one to the other, and you could send these chat messages back and forth among the community of people that knew how to use this. It was sort of in the early days when there was email, and this was the only instant chat message. And it, um, there's a, it's been around forever. It's almost all been completely taken over by bots and malware distributors and spammers to where um, there was a guy that got so tired, he used it. He said, people keep saying it's malicious. So he did a study, and he found out, yes, it's 99% malicious traffic. So there are a few free net groups that are actually people talking to other people, but mostly it's stolen property, porn, malware, and horrible things like that. But anyway, technically, it's, it's an instant message giant. It's out there. There are also secure drops. There's a bunch of these. Uh, this all came from Snowden. When Snowden wanted to leak out top secret NSA information to a reporter, he had a problem. How do I send it to them without the NSA catching it? He worked for the NSA, he knew what they could do. The thing that would work would be PGP email, which is encrypted. But the problem with PGP is in order to receive email, you have to generate a public-private key pair and send someone the public key, which is not easy to do. In fact, about five years ago, I took my CISSP class and I required them all to use PGP email and by the end of the semester, only about half the class had succeeded. It is really hard to do, and all the tools to make it easy don't work. So it's really painful. So he couldn't send his data to the reporter because the reporter couldn't do this. The reporter had to bring in a technical assistant, and Snowden was recording like YouTube videos telling you how to do it to try to get them to generate this stuff. It's hard to do. So after that, all the news agencies um, wanted to get more leaks because they made a lot of money by writing news articles about the Snowden leaks. So they each opened their own secure drop. Now, the um, may first one, the big one was WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks was Julian Assange, and WikiLeaks was very popular where you donate stuff and he would publish it, but he totally leaked out the identity of his sources a couple times. This is how Ch Chelsea Manning got arrested. WikiLeaks leaked out the identity of the person that leaked this classified military secrets. Now that's really rude. When you have a whistleblower that tells you illegal stuff and then you publish it, they don't want to get caught. That's kind of the whole deal. So the Washington Post and everybody else set up secure drops. They have an online system where you can send them information and supposedly it will be encrypted and hidden so they don't know who sent it there and they can't be subpoenaed for it or anything. I don't know how well they work, but everybody has it now. Every major news agency has a place to leak in secure tips. Um, I haven't heard anybody analyze them to see how good they are, but in the past they have not been good enough. Anyway, um, and then, of course, dark web marketplaces where you can uh, sell anything, just like eBay. And the Silk Road was the famous one. And then Silk Road 2, run by Ross Ulbricht, who they arrested like one mile from here, up at the Glen Park Library. Um, he was the CEO, he was the guy running Silk Road 2, and he didn't bother to use his VPN all the time. So sometimes his real IP address was visible to the FBI, so they tracked him down and arrested him at the library. Um, so in here you just find all sorts of illegal things for sale. And then Playpen. Playpen was the child pornography site. Um, and there, you would get privileges by uploading homemade child pornography. So a lot of these people were, in fact, kidnapping children and using them for pornography and then killing them and stuff, which is what they do. Um, in fact, I, I've talked to FBI agents whose job is to go bust the people in Santa Rosa that have children in cages in the basement because they're making this stuff. It's, I think, the top law enforcement priority, or it used to be before terrorism bumped it. Um, to stop this. So it's a really big deal. And so what the FBI did was they hacked into it. Now, this is how you take down a marketplace behind Tor. You can't get the IP address. You don't know its physical location. But what you do, you can send traffic to it. You can send web requests to it. So just like we're doing with the Web Security Academy, you find a vulnerability in the website and you hack the server. Then you put malware on the server, and they deface the page where it says, there's a security problem. You need to download the next version of Firefox to be safe. And when in that one, they put malware that would send your IP address back to the FBI. So that way, they were able to get the people that were viewing the site to expose themselves and become known to law enforcement, and they caught a bunch of them that way. So they got 350 arrests, but the problem is it was controversial, and I think they actually had to drop the cases because the FBI was in control of the server for two weeks installing malware onto computers, and this was all questionably illegal. 
um, to take over the server and then put malware on it and infect people when you don't even know where they are, you haven't really got a legal permission to do that. This is a lot like when the Microsoft takes over botnets, which they've done several times. They've even taken over botnets and sent out a cleaner to clean it, and all that is highly questionable legally because botnets are not located in one state or in one country, so what court can possibly give you permission to do that? They've somehow, Microsoft has managed to do it a few times, but this playpen thing, they weren't able to really handle the legal consequences of what they'd done. Uh, then there was Bayonet to take down a couple more of these online marketplaces. This was an international, um, uh, international law enforcement action taking down a $23 million site. Um, all right. And then, of course, all the virtual currencies. We all know fiat currencies. Now, there used to be currencies based on the gold standard long ago. So you actually had a vault full of gold to back your dollars. Uh, this turned out to be a bad system. People found that you could not adjust anything to deal with the Great Depression happened. They figured they can't do anything to adjust your currency to deal with conditions. So they switched to fiat currency, where the U.S. dollar is backed by nothing except the full faith and credit of the U.S. government and the full strength of the U.S. military, which turns out is more than nothing. So the U.S. dollar is greatly prized and considered a good store of value. And that's because it's backed by the government. But that's called a fiat currency because it's just issued by the government and it does not have any intrinsic value except its connection to that government, which will depend on what the government is. So now... Virtual currencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum and all the others are just mathematical curiosities. You create a number and Bitcoin, you, um, you mine Bitcoin. There's only so many Bitcoins that can be mined and they can't be forged or duplicated and you can't uh, lie about who owns them. They're each owned by somebody and they're cryptographically signed. So unless you lose your private key, nobody can steal your coins. So you've got them, but what value they have is not apparent at all. They're not connected to any government or anything. The only thing it is, is a cryptographic record that you own this thing and nobody else can take it. And that turns out, the value has risen up to what I think it's now about uh, 20,000 bucks for Bitcoin. So it turned out a lot of people had to use it. Originally, I and a lot of people said, this is garbage, it's not worth anything, the value will fall to zero, but it turned out that people, you could use it to commit crimes. The main crime people committed first was Silk Road, buying stuff online illegally. You had to use Bitcoin, so that gave the next crime thing is tax evasion. You can put your money in Bitcoin, and for a long time, nobody could track it, so you didn't pay taxes. And the third thing was money laundering evading whatever rules there are. This turned out to be a stable source of value because there are a lot of countries, like I think Venezuela, where the local currency is garbage. The inflation rate is like 50 or 80 percent. So if you save the local currency, it becomes worthless. So putting your money in Bitcoin is a lot better, and it's illegal. So you hide your money from your own government this way, and that turns out to be a lot of nations like that. So that's essentially money laundering, and there's a huge market for it, and that gives it some value. So anyway, there's a bunch of these virtual currencies, and um, out there, Bitcoin is the main one, but there's thousands of them now, the main one being Bitcoin and Ethereum. And um, anyway, so you have to have a wallet. Your stuff is all using encryption. Bitcoin uses SHA-256 for the public key, and the others use a variety of interesting cryptographic systems, which are in the, cryptograph in the cryptography course, if you care, although I'm, it's just in the extra credit projects this semester. I haven't been lecturing about it. Uh, well, that's we went off the gold standard because there was no way to change the value of a dollar. And it turned out that there are macroeconomic events when you would like to change the value of a dollar by like devaluing your currency. And there wasn't a way to do it. And, you, and if you want, sometimes you want to print more currency like we did when COVID hit. Europe and America both ran incredible deficits. We, we printed like $7 trillion worth of money and gave it to people so they could stop going to work during COVID. And so did the EU. Now, you can't do that on the gold standard because you only have so much gold. You'd have to go mine some more gold. Like printing is, the question of, is it good? Is it good? I don't think it's, is it good? Like is what? Printing money? Well, uh, that, that is the huge argument. Now, there are different economic theories. In the Keynesian theory, Econ economics is, the question is, what is money? If money is like gas or water and obeys the laws of physics, then if you print more money, it will just dilute the value and it'll go down in value. That's if it acts like gas or oxygen or something. Um, that is the Austrian model of economics. And by that model, you should use Bitcoin because people can't devalue it. Um, in fact, 
the Keynesian model appears to be true. For example, when, when we had TARPers the first time, and we, it did not seem to crash our economy at all to just print an incredible amount of money and give it out there for free to people. It didn't cause the dollar to fall like you would think it would in the, in the Austrian economy. It seems to be that Keynes was right. Keynes said money is not like water at all. It's just the mood of the people. If people are happy, everything's fine, and they're spending money and earning money and doing living life, and if people get miserable, then it's no good. It's not the amount divided by the number of goods at all. It's just whether it's moving around. And whether it's moving around depends on what mood people are in. This appears to be true. And we've had the experiment now. A bunch of people put money in Bitcoin expecting a huge crash when they printed all that money. The United States debt went way up. I expected this to destroy the currency, so did a lot of people because I thought of it like physics, and it didn't. It didn't crash, and Bitcoin fell just as much as the dollar. Bitcoin did not stay up when the dollar went down, so it was not a hedge against inflation. And so the Austrian model that models money as a physical quantity doesn't appear to be true. And it appears to be more a psychological thing, <laughs> harder to predict. And this leads you to things like Tesla and Elon Musk. Tesla sells at 10 times its value. Tesla, the market capitalization of Tesla is larger than all the other car companies on earth combined, which makes no sense at all. They don't make that many cars, they don't sell that many cars, they don't make that much money, but everybody thinks Elon Musk is Tony Stark, he's the greatest genius in the world, and I just want a piece of him, and being part of him means I'll get rich, rich, rich. And it appears to be true. It just went up again. He blew 50 billion on, te on Twitter, and he just made more than that as Tesla went up. It, he seems to be able to just endlessly inflate his money for more money in defiance of the fundamentals. It's not held up by actual value. It's just held up by his fame. So fame and popularity seem to be more important than actual fundamentals of how many cars do you sell, which is the kind of thing that offends physicists like me, but you know, that's the way the world, that's what Keynes said. He said, what matters is the feelings, not your mathematical equations that you guys love. Um, I, but I mean, this is only my opinion, uh, but I do say uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist, Paul Krugman, keeps writing articles in the New York Times explaining this, how you don't need to worry about national debt and just printing all this money is just fine. And I keep saying it can't be fine, but he keeps saying it's fine, and he appears to be right, and I appear to be wrong. Uh, anyway, let's see what's happening here. Uh, um, hey, Andrew Lamo, yeah, yeah. He's one of the old guys, uh, old hackers. Um, and uh, stock market was the bigger mistake. Well, hard to say. Stock market is, uh, seems to be working pretty well. It's also another thing that doesn't appear to make a lot of sense. I remember I worked with an East German years ago who came to America, and I explained to her the American stock market. You make a company, and its price just floats there, and people can just decide to buy or sell it, and then it will go down. And if everybody decides they don't like you, it goes down, and your company goes out of business, whether you like it or not. And she said, I wouldn't want to live in a system like that. I like my East German system where the government controls things and makes us safe. And I'm like... Well, you know, this is the American system. It's kind of crazy, but yeah, you could say that. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, all right. So you, now if you get Bitcoin you, and you want to hide it because now they can track it, you can run it through a tumbler. A tumbler will mix your money with other people's money like a swimming pool. You throw your money in one side, then you pull some money out of the other side, and there's no connection between those two things. This is a common way to launder money. You run it through a Bitcoin tumbler. Um, all right. And then there's online peer-to-peer -peer services like Venmo that are out there. And then there's web evidence. So you can go to the web. If you look at your websites, you might want to look at old versions. So the Wayback Machine has historical snapshots. And there's a lot of statistics. One of the most useful ones for malware research is DNS history to find out what previous domain names have been on this server and that you can track down servers that are being used for malicious activities. All right, and then um, if you want to do looking up information about people, then there's a whole lot of websites that will search people. You see ads for them all the time. Uh, you can find out how rich, one of the most common reasons anybody does this is to find out how rich somebody is before they sue them, to find out how much money they can realistically get out of them by suing them for something. Um, but you might want it for any number of other reasons. And there's a whole bunch of search sites. There used to be a guy that gave a talk every year at 
Hope, the hacking conference in New York City, and he was a private investigator. He said, people don't understand, if you're a private investigator, you can pay a fee and get access to an online search engine that will tell you everything about everybody. I know your bank account, I know your credit card number, I know your phone number, I have a list of all the cities you've been in. You can just buy this stuff if you're a private investigator. It's all out there. And it's gotten much, much worse since then. Um, the Papa John's app, the pizza joint, Papa John's is run by Christians and they take Sunday off. And so as a gimmick, they said, we're gonna track where everybody goes on Sunday, who are Papa John's customers. So everybody with Papa John's app on their phone, they put up commercial, we tracked them, here's what restaurant they all go to on Sunday. It didn't occur to them that maybe everybody didn't really want to know that Papa John's knows everything you do and everywhere you go, just from putting their app on your phone. But this is true of all the apps you put on your phone. They know your location and they send all this data back to the company and they sell it and resell it and resell it. So it's out there. And this is why the FBI and the police get an attitude saying, why can't we buy that data? Why do I need to get a search warrant? Everybody else has just got all the data. <laughs> why don't we just buy it too? And some of the police departments have started just buying that tracking data. And then there's arguments over whether that's legal. But anyway, it's, um, Americans are very heavily surveilled, <laughs> partly through the apps on your phone and the uh, cameras everywhere and all sorts of stuff. I think I read a study like five years ago that said the average person has 178 photographs of them taken throughout the day as you wander around. Um, in fact, you know, the Lauren Boebert thing just hit where she went to a theater and was groping the guy with her and vaping and then tried to lie about it. And so they, the theater owners took the video and put it out publicly so everybody can see it. And one thing is, they're apparently filming everything everybody does in theaters. I was not aware of this. Many people were not aware of this. But apparently they have detailed cameras recording what everybody does in a theater. Uh, I wonder if every theater is like that. I wonder what they do with that data. It's an interesting issue. <laughs> anyway. Well, sure, the cameras on the street, I understand. But I, I didn't think theater owners bothered to record what was going on in the theaters, but I wonder if they do it in movie theaters. What's that? Well, I guess, but I mean, how often does somebody do something in a theater that you have to, unless they're gonna, but unless they're gonna set the place on fire, what are they gonna do that you would care about? I mean, I, I, if I was running the company, I would say, well, what are we gonna find that matters to us? As long as they paid for a ticket and they don't set fire to the place, why do we care what they do? But maybe there's something bad they could do that I should care about. I wonder. Uh, it is, oh, well, it's, it's not a public, it's privately owned, but I think they, and I think, in matter of fact, if they're recording you, I think they'd have to tell you that, but I don't know. It's an interesting issue. Um, I do know, though, one of my friends who is a police officer told me he can't go to the Daly City Theater, said I can't stand to go there because there are all the drug deals going on all around me in the in restaurant, and in the bathroom and everything. I said, I never noticed anything. He said, you don't know what to look for. But apparently they're selling drugs in the theater all over the place, that's what he said. And I guess it could be true. Uh, I, I'm sure they're a little bit careful. It's a, it's a front for selling drugs. What's that? It's a front for selling drugs. Well, uh, I don't know, but the customers use it to sell drugs, apparently. Yeah, good. They sell drugs in downtown all the time. They sell drugs downtown in the theaters? No, I mean downtown. Street. On the street, yeah. But apparently in the theater, according to him. I don't know. Uh, it could be. He's the expert. Anyway, there's a lot of these search engines, a lot of... Uh, places to look up groups of various kinds and a lot of instant messages we've already talked about like Skype and Discord and Slack where information about people and all the social media out there so you can really track down what people are doing. I remember um, 20 years ago, people would routinely search through people's trash to find out what they're doing. They throw away their phone bills and stuff and now they say, you don't need to do that anymore, you just go on Twitter. It's all just right, the Twitter and Facebook, everybody just publishes everything about their life up there. Um, the Internet Archive is good for textbooks. I didn't know that. All right. Someone says, find to print infinite money until the inevitable boom-bust cycle, but the Keynesians can always bring the capitalists. Well, that's true. I don't really know. Uh, econom economics seems to be a mystery. Um, and uh, AI to track movie hoppers. Well, maybe that's it. Maybe they, but I never heard of them busting anybody who hops movies. I, I think they're checking. And they do. Sometimes they have check and ticket in front. Yeah. But yeah, that might work. Movie theater cameras, mostly to prevent people from recording the movies. Oh, 
You're right. They're real hard about that. That might be what we're looking for. She, if you're making a bootleg copy of the movie, that they probably have to do, or the people that distribute the film will get mad. That might be it. They probably, they probably have to worry about getting sued, right? So they about what? Have to say some evidence. Yeah, that's right. But that's true. They do get real mad if you try to film the movie. That's true. Um, Daily City Movie Theater is one of the few that doesn't do assigned seating. So you just sit next to any of them. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, all right. Um, all right, and then of course social media and then um, internet protocols. There's a tool that uses metadata hidden within documents to locate similar ones. That looks pretty interesting. I haven't tried that one. I have used metadata though. I used to teach Microsoft Office about 20 years ago and um, people would have to make Word documents and PowerPoint presentations and they would copy other people's ones and the metadata totally shows you that. If you look inside at the properties inside Microsoft Word, any Microsoft Office, it will tell you the original creation date, the original owner, when it was copied, when it was changed. So they would come and say, I didn't cheat, I said you cheated and this evidence would hold up in court, just shut up. I mean, I've been to court, <laughs> I did what I did, I used to do forensic investigations for, for you know, anyway, so. Uh, there's a lot of internal data in documents, and so that's interesting. And uh, people say you might find data in your router's RAM. I'm pretty skeptical about that. Uh, all the router knows is what IP addresses have been connected to recently. I'd like to know what that important data in a router's RAM is. I feel like there's not much in the RAM. Remember, this is what Trump said. Trump said they they rigged China hacked in and rigged the election machines, and we need to investigate the routers to prove that. And I was like many people saying the routers won't have any evidence. But anyway, maybe. Router, well, routers just yeah. have a record of what IP addresses have been connected to recently, so they would tell you that, but they don't have the contents of the data or anything. So Maybe you might. Catch yeah, but yeah. Anyway. Um, Unless they hotwire one to capture all the data. What's that? Unless they hotwire one to capture. Yes, all the data. that's true. You, know, you can put malware in routers, and then it can do things like copy data and stuff. That's true. But but router just running as a router doesn't really keep track of much of anything. Anyway, so law enforcement um, has got a lot of centers that are out there to help organize this stuff, like NCIC is out there in National Counterterrorism and so on, and Interpol for international ones. And so there's a lot of online crime. Identity theft is the big one, although the number one, I don't know if they count in this class, but anybody want to guess what the number one online crime that affects Americans is? There's one outlier way ahead of all the rest. What steals the most money from Americans? Any guesses? It's kind of Camcorders? I don't know. Uh, oh, skimmers? Uh, skimmers. No, it's not skimmers. Well, that's a good guess. Any other guesses? Uh, scam callers, like calling by IP or something. Scam callers. Well, uh, you have to be more specific. But what did they say when they catch? Ready to reach? They're calling from uh, IT department. Like, or oh, the IT department. Uh, and that's not the most common one. That certainly happens. Let's see if there's any coming in on Twitch. Dead people's IDs? No. You may not get it. Um, this is one of those things that will stump people. But I, I saw this, this is a study about a year ago. The number one money stealer is romance scams, oh. where they call you and convince you they're in love with you and I'm going to marry you and you should invest in this cryptocurrency or something. They call it pig butchering in China. And um, they, that's the number one thing that steals money from Americans now is romance scams. And when I mentioned this before, many of my students have said, oh, yes, it happened to my father, it happened to my grandfather. It's, it's all over the place. And... Um, well, here's another related one that should get you. What is the most common crime committed in America? Can anybody get this one? Yeah, what's the crime that happens many, the most times per day? Most times per year? Stealing. What is it? Stealing. I can't hear you. Stealing. 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 No, it's not stealing. Not theft. It's another one. Stumps everybody. It's amazing. See if anybody on Twitch has an idea. Speeding, yes, it's speeding. Oh, yeah. Going over 55 happens basically all the time every day. <laughs> That's the one, speeding. Not J speeding is the one, tax I'm not 55, I'm not 65. Yeah, but whatever it is, people go over it all the damn time, like 90% of the time. So that's the number one crime. Anyway, um, all right, so, uh, you got identity theft is the main one, one, one main form of crime and stolen credit cards are sold all over the place. And electronic medical records are more valuable than social security numbers. 
And I think so are World of Warcraft accounts, at least they used to be, because you can make a lot of money by selling their stuff. Um, and, uh, like, and counterfeit, uh, these are things to stop people from violating American export controls. And cyberbullying is big, especially in the teen set. Uh, this causes a lot of suicides and self-harm among teenagers as they get bullied by people online. And, and a whole lot of people now on Twitter, now that Elon Musk has sort of opened the floodgates and let the rotten people be there. Um, and social media, of course, a lot of it is just uh, inspired by politics or just general meanness, just harassing people because they get a thrill out of hurting people. Anyway, so they capture your online communication. There's a lot of ways you can catch a screen capture uh, by just taking a photograph of the screen or pressing keys. You can do video evidence, viewing cookies, will record where people have been. And the registry, as we talked about before, keeps a lot of logs of everything you're doing on a Windows machine. And your browsers have a lot of records in the history and the favorites and the cache and all over the place. So like I say, if you've been doing something on a computer and you want to lie about it later, you're in big trouble, unless you use something like Tails, like we were saying, something that really erases all the tracks. Normal computers keep tons of evidence about everything you do, and that's why forensic examiners are so valuable. You can totally find out what people so have been the doing. Computer in computers, this is a very good question. You don't know, have to reset a computer to factory settings. Computers do not have an option to reset to factory settings. What some computers do is they have a thing called restore it to its original condition. But what that is, is a ghost image that will restore the operating system back to its original state, but that doesn't erase the unused sectors. So that's like reinstalling the OS. That doesn't clean the data. The only, the only thing that will clean the data is to do a forensic wipe of the hard drive, which will take like overnight, and, or get a tool like Eraser. It, those, all those things do is restore the active files to make the operating system run again, but they don't erase all the leftover data. So. It's a, it's a very good question. Now on an iPhone, if you go into the iPhone settings and reset to factory default, that cleans all the data. Because iPhones are encrypted ever since the 3S, they are always encrypted before you ever start using it. So everything you put on there was encrypted. And when you reset to factory default, it erases the key. Now all the leftover data becomes inaccessible. And the more expensive Androids, uh, supposedly can do this too, although I've not seen a test to see if it works. But iPhones, it has been proven experimentally, a forensic company bought 100 used iPhones and tried to recover data. They could not get any data from any of them. So that really, you can reset your iPhone and sell it to somebody and it's okay. That is not true of essentially any other computing device. You can't give it to somebody else or donate it to a school unless you know how to clean it first. And there is no provision in the default operating system that will thoroughly clean it. So you have, to, you have to really run it through a forensic tool like Derek's boot and nuke is the main one used for computers. That's a common tool to completely erase everything on a hard drive. What was that name again? Derek's boot and nuke. I'll put it up here. Derek's. This is the classic one. People have been using it for years. Yes. Derek's boot and nuke is the classic one. D-band. This will do like seven or 14 passes with random things. And... Uh, it'll completely wipe it out. There are simpler tools like Eraser and like the disk part built into Windows that will do it, but this is the classic one people use, Derek's D-Man. Everybody loves this. But, 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 uh, nowadays, the operating systems are pre-installed, so you, you, don't, you don't have the, the, um, the security to actually install this anymore, so how, how does... Don't, or you, I think you can probably put it on a USB stick. The original one you put on, a, you had to boot from this, and then it wipes out every drive on the machine. Sure. So, Absolutely. It wipes everything out, including the operating system, including, so you'd have to make a backup first or have installed this. Yeah. So that's why you normally do it because you're done with that machine. That's right. That's right. So I mean, well, if you, but you don't, if you back up, you don't back up the deleted files. You know, a normal backup utility only backs up the active data. So if you wanted to get rid of the old files, you could do like that restore you described, then do a backup, then do a oh, D-band. Like, there's a Windows installer you can set up like boot like from fresh. For this? No, no, I mean, for, if you want to like, uh, 
windows. Where you've only installed windows, yeah. you get windows a, you get a Windows installer ISO, yeah. or, and then you boot from that, and then you install the operating system. But when you do, it does not erase all the empty data. That's why reinstalling Windows doesn't clean your well, machine. First you, use, first you use this, then you reinstall the OS and all the apps. You'll need the key, and you'll need all the keys for all your software and all that, so it's not a small thing. That's why people don't normally do this for a machine they're using. They do this when they're giving away a machine or throwing it away. That would be the normal case, because, of course, your machine becomes unusable, and it's a lot of work to rebuild it. Yes. Yes, that would work. If you reset it to defaults, and then backed it up, and then deband it, and then restored it from that image, then you'd have a machine that didn't have any old data. I think that's true. Very good. They're just the right questions. All right, now let's see what's happening. God loves deband. Okay. Um, uh, isn't it possible to create a fake screenshot? Oh, it totally is. In fact, there was a famous case where somebody actually did this. They hated their boss. So they went to their boss's machine and put like kitty porn on it and tried to get their boss in trouble for it. This did happen. This sort of thing people think it could happen. It really happened. So you can do that. You can frame other people. Um, images have metadata. Are there logs for a deleted VM on the main machines? Um, no, I don't think so. I think if you run a virtual machine and you surf the internet and that, and then you delete the virtual machine, I think it would all be gone, although I'm not entirely sure. You'd have to test that. That's a good question. If you use a virtual machine, are there any logs on the host of what was happening in the virtual machine? And I would think not much, but maybe something, especially if you have shared folders turned on. Um, but that's a pretty good idea. If you used a virtual machine to do stuff and then you deleted the virtual machine, uh, the problem is when you delete it, the deleted files are not gone. You would have to forensically erase that virtual machine. If you delete the files, the data is still there. So you'd have the same problem. Yeah, everything in the virtual machine is really on the host machine. Now, if you encrypted the virtual machine with BitLocker or something, then maybe it'd be okay, but you'd have to test it. I wonder where that key is. These are good questions, and I don't know the answer. It's not simple. Um, I think you can spoof message data. You can... And the other uh, D-band, kill disk is another tool. Okay, yeah, yep, good. All right, anyway, there's a, there's a lot of these tools to forensically wipe machines. All right, so I think that's it for this, and we should do a uh, Kahoot for lecture five. A lot of good questions, that's good. All right, let's see if I got it in my favorites. Uh, I don't, all right, let me find it the other way. Uh, mod five. I knock it off, I want to go here, there we go. There it is, okay. Okay. today.
That's true, it makes the competition tough. We'll see. All right. All right, what technique catches a criminal in the act? That's a sting. We all know this from the movies. All right. All right, what system uses dot onion addresses? That's Tor, okay, stands for the onion router. It's a, it's a secure drop, the, the file you've got me is unencrypted? Uh, the secure drop is a service run by like a newspaper where you can drop files and it will be all anonymized. That's the idea. So the file you're dropping can be unencrypted? Yeah, you, what you put up there has got to be unencrypted so they can read it, but they hide your identity and don't keep logs so they don't know where it came from. That's the idea. So if the law comes and demands that they reveal their sources, they don't know the source. That's the idea. That's what they want. They want it to be like, in the old days, you would just slip a piece of paper under the door and then run away. They want some way for you to leak secrets to the newspaper. That's the idea. And like I say, I haven't seen a real analysis of how good they are, how well they work, but there are some famous examples of them failing spectacularly and leaking out the identity of the source, which is not what you want. But there's no guarantee, right? There's never a guarantee, absolutely. Especially if you're doing something really bad like the NSA. You know, messing with the NSA, it's hard to believe that anything would stop them from catching you. That's why, you know, Snowden didn't even bother to hide. He just admitted it. There's probably no realistic, prop, no realistic option of hiding from the NSA. So you might as well just admit it. Yeah. Anyway, um, all right, so what dark website distributed child porn? Playpen. You hit Silk Road or something? Anyway. Yeah, anyway. No, that was Playpen. All right. And, uh, I thought Silk Road had everything, no? Well, Silk Road might have had some, but that wasn't the main thing. That's what Playpen's main thing was. So Playpen was the best answer. But you're right. There probably was some of that on Silk Road, too. It had pretty much everything. All right. And where's the public record of cryptocurrency transactions? I think Silk Road had whatever people wanted to put up there. It was like eBay. People would just put stuff on Silk Road. It wasn't controlled by the owner. So, probably anything. Uh, it's the blockchain, of course. All right. Yeah. Was a ledger one of the options? Oh, a lecture about the dark web? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that much about it. I've only done simple things on it. There's other people that use it a lot and know all about it. Um, Levi and Ian. All right, Tant and Levi sound like real names. Ian might be enough. Uh, my grader might not be able to figure out who you are just from that information, though. What's that? It's good for the student to learn the surveillance. To learn about, yeah, sure, good for students to learn about the dark web, sure. Yeah. Yeah, 